Hello, welcome all. Uh, I am Vishwas Dhate. I am a structural engineer by profession with experience of more than 25 years. Uh, in the initial period of my professional life, I worked with various companies and worked on variety of commercial industrial projects. Uh, in the last few years, I have been associated with software development for structural engineers earlier through SQ Future Tech. Now uh, through Bentley, because a couple of years ago we were acquired by Bentley and now I am part of Bentley team. Uh, as part of Bentley, we are proud to uh, support engineers worldwide uh, to help uh, uh, themselves uh, to do better engineering ultimately. Uh, today we are going to talk about uh, design of beams and slabs, RCC beams and slabs. Uh, we will be covering some general aspects and also we'll be covering some software related aspects. So let's uh, get on with the presentation. Uh, just a footnote. So because of the situation of COVID, everybody is working from home and there might be power outages, internet connections, drops like that. So for the ease of presentation, I have recorded my own presentation and presenting it to through videos. Uh, of course, if we, uh, we are available online for the question and answers. Uh, so in the background, we will be looking at questions as and when possible. And uh, uh, we'll be interacting to you through uh, some questions after the presentations. Please uh, participate in those questionnaires. Thank you. Hello. Welcome all. Today we are going to discuss about design of beams and slabs. In beams, we are going to cover some special cases. And in slabs, we are going to look at general workflow of design empirical method of deflection check, and uh, special cases of loading for slabs. So in design, as I mentioned, we are looking to look at some special cases. One is torsion. Now torsion, as all of us know, is a twisting action that gets applied on RCC structure. Now it may be applied due to various conditions, uh, which are part of your analysis. The com most common condition is a uh, cantilever slab coming out of a beam, which will not only cause a vertical load on the beam, but also a torsion due to its own action on the beam. Uh, sometimes it is necessary to design the beams for not just the vertical bending, but also lateral bending or bending in plan or even axial forces. Now such beams are designed for not just vertical load of the beam, but also lateral action on the beam and axial force. Uh, we'll see why these things are necessary in some specific cases, but this is one of the interesting topics. And a third and the most important as aspect is ductility. Now, ductility is very common in uh, India, specifically or zones where your earthquakes occur. And ductility ensures that structure remains and does not collapse. You know, that is the most important aspect. And that's why beams which support the vertical loads are one of the critical elements of the ductility requirements. Now, in ductility, you basically look at plastic information at top and bottom reinforcement and the shear cracks that may arise due to the plastic action of the beam. For design of slabs, we will be looking at the panel method of design, wherein after the geometry is read, the slabs are uh, divided into panels based on how they are supported. And then the, based on the aspect ratio of uh, spans, which is Ly by Lx, the further design is calculated. Uh, we are going to look at uh, empirical check for deflection. Now, uh, deflection analysis for slabs is quite complex phenomena because of various conditions of loading, supports, continuity of beams and slab, etc. So it's a quite complex phenomena. Uh, to do deflection check for a simple one-way slab might be an uh, easy thing to do because of the load distribution pattern. But to do that in a two-way slab and that two with uh, multiple consecutive panels is going to be very, very critical. And hence, quite a few times, this empirical approach for design deflection is adopted and this forms an important aspect of slab design. And we are also going to look at slab design for special cases like point load or triangular load or a partial UDL applied on the slab. Now coming to design of beams with special cases, we'll first look at uh, torsion. Now common occurrences of torsion uh, that you may know, we already seen this case wherein a torsion is due to the cantilevered slab coming out of a column. 
Now, due to various uh, conditions of analysis, there may be torsion in beams, and that may arise out of differential settlement, you know, different loads on different sides of beam, or different kind of column stiffnesses on both connections of the beam, and so on. Another typical example of this is going to be edge beam of a flat slab. Now, if you look at a cross-section of a beam, edge beam with a flat slab, the slab thickness is uh, decently strong compared to the beam itself. And as a result, whatever is the negative movement that slab can develop due to the beam stiffness will go as a torsion in the beam. So it's like a uh, beam stiffness contributing to its own torsion. Now, that's a very uh, important thing to understand. And also, uh, due to other beams supported on a primary beam, now, if the other beam has very uh, high amount of reinforcement at top, you know, at the end junction, then that means it has large capacity of bending moment, and it is, in a way, equivalent capacity of torsion in the main beam. And another common aspect is beams which support floating columns. Now, uh, floating columns by inherent property of itself will attract bending moments at the base, and that will get, so minor axial bending moment in a floating column might get transferred as a torsion on the beam. Now, apart from these cases listed, there may be other issues like, you know, beams connected to core walls, which have a different dynamic behavior, beams which are connecting to columns which have unequal settlement, uh, beams which have a large cutout on one side and a large load on the other side, wherein the there is no stiffness available, you know, from the slab to resist torsion, and so many such cases. So torsion is a very critical aspect, and uh, in industrial structures, due to the uh, equipment support, which are you know typically at a higher level than the floor, or they are hanging from the floor, and then that at that same location they will also transfer the lateral shear, you know, that is resisting. And all of it will cause basically torsion in the beam. So torsion is a very, very critical aspect and a very common aspect and often neglected in design of beams. So that's why it is critical to look at them. Uh, critical aspects of torsion are uh, that torsion by its own action affects the entire surface of the beam, all four sides of the beam, uh, if, you mean, if you understand what I'm saying. So it will affect the top surface, bottom surface, and both the side surfaces. Unlike flexural thing. So, for example, in a flexural behavior, your end moments may be heavy due to the fixed end action, or your mid-span may be uh, moment may be heavy due to vertical load. But in torsion, it's the entire surface, shear, both side surface, everywhere you have the effect of torsion. And one of this uh, is due to the cross-section aspect ratio of the beam itself. Now, the, here is an example of two beams with exact or same cross-section area. But a squarish beam will perform much, much better in torsion compared to a taller rectangular beam. So this is one of the aspects that we should remember while proportioning the structure, you know, in terms of how it is going to affect the overall behavior. Uh, torsion uh, can be understood uh, by approximating it like a thin wall uh, hollow core tube, you know, wherein the peripheral stress is much higher compared to the stress near the center due to torsion. Now, this, when it gets added to your normal design shear for vertical bending, then it becomes a dominant uh, design case for the shear enforcement. So that's why torsion is very critical. And as all of us know, shear failure is something is very brittle and we want to avoid at all costs. So all the more importance you, know, you need to provide for torsion. Now, it's not just shear. So if the, by inherent nature of the torsion, you will have all the four corners you know, of beam sort of getting warped and it will uh, cause an additional tension tension in the reinforcement, especially towards the corner bars. So that means you have to design the longitudinal reinforcement for the effect of torsion. And also it will cause the additional side base, uh, side uh, face reinforcement. Uh, as we saw, the cracks are all over surfaces. So this will uh, help reduce the cracking and it will ultimately provide the torsional strength to cut the shear flow from the torsion. Now, if you look at RCDC specific uh, development, let's look at typical design settings due to torsion. So you have a setting called ignore torsion. Now, very often uh, the buildings are modeled without the slab. 
we model only the columns and beams for a lot of things. It's a convenient thing to do. It uh, you you can still apply proper load and it gets distributed properly on the beam without the slab being in place and so on and so forth. Uh, as a result, uh, the stiffness of the slab itself is not available in the 3D analysis, and which may sometimes result in a false kind of action of torsion on some beams. So that's why a lot of consultants believe that uh, a tor small amount of torsion may be neglected as far as design is concerned. Now we give that choice to user where the user can specify a maximum threshold value, a value below which we will ignore torsion, value above which we will consider torsion in design. Other thing that we saw uh, earlier is the shear reinforcement is uh, very critical for torsion and torsion actually causes higher shear near the surfaces and not inner core. So in a way to counter that, if we have a higher diameter of shear stirrups for the outer legs and lesser diameter for the inner legs, it may perform better as far as torsional capacity is concerned. Another thing that you can look to do is uh, both based on optimization and maximization. So maximization in terms of the amount of reinforcement that you provide and optimization in terms of the uh, number of legs or the spacing of the stirrups that you want to provide. So if you keep the spacing round off to a five millimeter value, then you can achieve much economy compared to a 25 millimeter value, right? So if I uh, require, by calculation, I require 116 millimeters of spacing. And if I am applying 25 millimeter as a tolerance, that means I straight away come down to 100 millimeters. Whereas if I am applying five millimeters, I will come down to 115 millimeters which will result in economy ultimately. Another aspect is side reinforcement. We saw earlier, right? The torsion affects all the reinforcements in the cross-section and side face reinforcement actually perform a role in the resistance torsion. Now, as a result, if you are expecting beams with heavy torsion, then you should try and use diameters that are higher than normally considered even for side face reinforcement. So in case, uh, let's say you have maximum as 16 millimeters and my design requires say 20 millimeters, we will report a failure for torsion and you will not be able to perhaps understand why it is reporting a failure. It may be coming out of the fact that I cannot put enough number of side phase reinforcement bars with the diameters that you have chosen. So this is something that you should look at, especially if you have heavy torsion. Now, as we saw, the impact of this torsion is on all the designs, right? So first and foremost is the aspect ratio of the cross-section. So B by D ratio or D by B ratio, whatever you want to say, uh, will play a critical role in uh, the distribution of tensile reinforcement across the faces, the calculation of threshold value, and all of those things. Other is, you know, you allow the outer stirrups to be stronger compared to inner stirrups in this case of torsion, which is very important because then you again achieve economy and also, you know, you put reinforcement where it is required and instead of providing across the cross section. Another thing that we mentioned is longitudinal rebars are required to be more than normal flexural requirement. Now in Indian code, for example, torsion is converted into an equivalent bending moment and it's an indirect way of controlling the additional longitudinal reinforcement. Whereas in ACI code, you calculate the longitudinal reinforcement required for torsion and then distribute it across the faces to go for final detailing. And other thing is, of course, side face reinforcement. So once you calculate the amount of torsional reinforcement required, then you can proportion the side face reinforcement. And as we mentioned, uh, depending on the depth available, you may want to use higher diameter to minimize the number of bars on the side. Now, if you look at design calculation reports for torsion, uh, first let us look at longitudinal reinforcement. So you can see, uh, now this is ACI code report. So we calculate the critical torsion or tau CR by four. Now, if this threshold torsion is not exceeded, then that particular torsion can be ignored. Whereas when it is exceeding, you will notice that we actually calculate the longitudinal reinforcement that is required as a total. So in this case, it is like 115, 55 millimeters squares. 
and then we distribute it proportionally along the periphery. And once that is done, uh, it is added to the flexural reinforcement that is calculated separately. And then that will become our required AST at that location, which will be detailed properly. So this is how a simple uh, method of you know, looking at torsion as far as the effect on main steel is concerned. Now, effect on stirrups, we actually saw earlier that outer stirrups are most important for torsion. So that straight away, you consider the maximum torsion and design the outer stirrups for that. Based on then that, uh, using the spacing criteria, the diameters available, number of legs possible total, you first detail that. What is the uh, right amount of par dia combination and spacing that you can use? Then uh, you can calculate the inner shear stirrups required based on the vertical shear action, whatever it is. And then combining these two, you get finally the total shear reinforcement required. So this is how a typical design calculation uh, for a beam with heavy torsion will look like. Now coming to side phase reinforcement, uh, we saw that we calculate critical torsion. Uh, if it is higher than the threshold value, then uh, you consider it for design. Once you do that, you based on the spacing criteria, you come find out how many number of bars that can be possible to put. And then you consider that number of bars and the distributed torsional reinforcement that comes for side phase and you detail the side phase reinforcement. So that's how we take care of tor design for torsion in RCDC. Now coming to second topic uh, with axial force and biaxial bending. Uh, let us first look at the possible issues, you know, where it can happen. So this is again going to happen if you have floating columns. For example, floating columns not only will cause a bending in the girder, it may actually result in a strut tie kind of an action between the upper and lower floors and cause a compression, you know, especially on the upper level for columns. A uh, very high uh, amount of equipments, uh, the way you can see in the image, are supported at a level which is above the floor level. And they are sometimes vibratory or sometimes even rotary equipments. And as a result, they pass on that entire horizontal lateral force on the floor itself, and which will be often, you know, to be taken by the beams. Or in case of tall buildings with podiums or the basements where you have sudden change of cross-section area uh, in terms of the plan area, uh, you may have uh, something called as a back tie, back stay effect. And uh, that uh, sort of results in a very high amount of axial force on the floor. Now that of course gets shared between slabs and beam, but in some cases, uh, beams which are specifically designed to carry this lateral force are also required. And if we have unsymmetrical framing, you know, building plans of different geometries which are unsymmetrical, all of us know that will result in tor dynamic torsion. And that torsion in plan of the building will ultimately cause actual forces in quite a few cases in the beams, especially at the periphery. Now, when do you decide you want to use this, you know, for design? So, of course, you have to first look at the behavior in 3D analysis. So, you have to first of all find out if beam is actually undergoing this kind of a twisting or a lateral bending action, you know, due to any of the loads that are applied or whatever the other reasons. So, this is uh, like a normal bending plus a lateral bending about a vertical axis, right? So, the beam will bend about a vertical axis. Uh, very of most cores have a threshold value, you know, which distinguishes between a beam action and a column action. So typically, all the ductility requirements, specifically, are applicable as a column if your average axial stress is more than 0.1 FCP. So in other words, the beams which have average axial stress more than 0.1 FCK need to be designed like a column, practically. 
or you might have external loads on the beams which are causing it to have actual force or a lateral load. Uh, again, as you saw, uh, examples like uh, equipments, you know, or uh, uh, very high kind of uh, obstruction surfaces which gather a lot of wind load and pass on to a very particular member, you know, those kind of things. Uh, if you have industrial flooring where you have either grating, steel grating directly supported on LCC beams, or you may not have any slab at all. It might be only a grid of beams. In this case, the beams are subjected to loads in both directions, vertical as well as horizontal, and it might cause you know lateral bending or even actual forces. Which are the important uh, actions that you want to look at? So as we mentioned, beam in a way becomes a horizontal column. So you have to treat it like a beam as far as the visual effect is considered, but the design has to be like a column. Now, how do you do that? So you basically primary complete the design for your vertical bending or the main bending that you have. Then you check the additional effects of your actual force or and lateral bending. So lateral bending may be without actual force or actual force only will be there. No lateral bending is there. All permutations are possible. You have to check the effect of those. For example, if it's a compressive actual force, it may not have any impact as far as the reinforcement is concerned. But if it's a tensile actual force, then it will add to reinforcement. So those that thing is big. You know, important in terms of trying to understand what kind of force is applied. And ultimately, on site, it is going to be cast like a beam. So you will have a horizontal shutter, you will put rebars, you know, and then come to pour the concrete. So it has to be detailed like a beam. So the action is like a column, but the detailing is like a beam. That's the difference, you know. Now, what are the design settings in RCDC for doing that? So let's look at the first and foremost is a tick box. And you, know, you have to check that box and tell the software that, okay, I want to design my beams using this particular uh, action. Once you set, uh, no, once you want to go and see what settings are available, there'll be another form. And on that form, you'll have to, you'll be asked what type of beams you want to consider for this. So they may be only primary beams or only secondary beams or beam features of columns as support on both sides, some specific conditions, you know, things like that. Another aspect is, you know, similar to torsion, what we discussed, there may be a threshold value below which you want to neglect the axial force or a bilateral bending, bilateral bending. So both are possible. And this is very critical. So for columns, tenderness effect is a very important aspect because of the sway conditions and non-sway conditions, stiffness and so on. But for beams, if there are slabs connected to the beam, then beam has literally infinite strength as far as the actual force is concerned. And as a result, uh, the beam, you can consider it to be propped along the length for avoiding the slenderness part of it. It is not going to avoid the design, but because it is connected to slab, it is never a slender action. Once you do this, you are design, uh, you know, proceed to design what, whatever you want to do. Uh, design is complete and you want to see look how the design looks. So immediate impact that you can notice is in the shear reinforcement. You may not notice any impact in the main reinforcement because it is, as we mentioned, detailed like a beam. But when you come to cross-section with shear reinforcement, you will notice horizontal links as if it's a column cross-section. Now, this is because of the lateral bending that is coming in the beam. So you can see you have vertical reinfo main reinforcement, which may be added you know, to cater for axial force and bilateral bending. But most importantly, you will see horizontal stirrups in the beam apart from vertical stirrups. If you look at detailed calculation report in RCDC, you will look at, let's say, a single section wherein your bending moment is not very high, but because of uh, the actual force, you know, by axial action, you may require additional steel, and that needs to be added to the flexible like, steel that is already calculated. So if you look at the difference between left at top and what, right at top, you will notice that the flexural reinforcement is very high in right section, 
and additional there is an additional torsional reinforcement which will you know give you final detail uh coming to moment capacity check so since as i mentioned it might be detailed like a beam but it will still behave like a column so for each zone we give the report for critical actions of uh, compression and biaxial bending which will give something like a column a capacity ratio and that we check against the permitted value and that's how the final reinforcement detailing is adopted and you will see a term called percentage reinforcement for the entire cross section and not just top or bottom so in this case you have uh, top bars bottom bars and side bars to give you the desired capacity and if you look at uh, the report itself it will give you the load angle the critical p value for which the design is governed and capacity now let us look at uh, the third topic for beams which is ductility let's have a quick look at why and what so what is ductility it is uh, basically how it fails a particular element for example in this figure you can see abc a is having a very crooked kind of a this surface but it is very uh, single surface whereas b you see is there is small uh, necking and then there is a failure and in c you will see that the there is a long necking and uh, the failure is practically at a point now so c is the most ductile and e is, a is the least ductile in this now how it helps so before the element breaks because of the necking it will keep on absorbing lot of load and energy so that's how capacity uh, energy is absorbed due to ductility and that helps now why it helps because it avoids sudden failure and earthquake is a very quick event i mean it occurs within less than few minutes right and it might not give enough time for people to escape from the building now if your structure collapses then it becomes damaging to everybody inside but if it does not collapse it gives enough time then people can easily escape there could be rescue operation there could be some other things that you can do in that time so that's how it is important to have not a sudden failure how it actually works so if you look at the red links that are normal structure whereas the yellow or the blue ring is ductile so if it is ductile it will keep on elongating till it breaks and it will give you enough chance to look at the structure during that period so that's how the ductility happens now why is it required in beams because as we all know beams are typically framed between columns and they are important element of frame action what we call so column and beam together form the frame they are subjected to vertical loads and primarily subjected to lateral loads in earthquake and that is what causes the frame action uh, and other thing is even though earthquake has occurred and you know we are past the event of earthquake the beam still needs to stand and continue to support gravity loads otherwise it would be catastrophic So that's why it is important to consider that. Now, uh, when earthquake is coming from left, for example, then you will have the maximum moments at top left and bottom right, and when the earthquake changes direction, you will have maximum moment at top right and bottom left. So it is a reversible action, right? So you are actually ultimately, if as beam has uh, formed uh, failure conditions or plastic hinges, there will be all four. joints next to column that will be having those hinges and that's why it is very critical so as we saw there is a concept of plastic hinge formation and that is a very important thing to consider so uh, during lateral uh, movement along with the vertical load you will have moments that cause a tension at top and the left and a tension at bottom on the right Uh, and it will lead to the cracking of concrete in a way or the plastic hinge formations what we call it when the direction of earthquake changes so does the direction of movement and which ultimately result in uh plastic hinges on the other remaining parts of the beam 
once that is done then the beam is plastic and it has to be ductile so detailing is interlinked in as a part of ductility how it is interlinked so diameter the size of the column that supports the beam plays a role in terms of determining what diameters beam can be used by detailing other aspect is the top rebar of the beam is linked to bottom rebar a certain percentage of top rebar has to be there throughout the beam 50% of top rebar has to be there at the bottom of beam and so on then the design is based on capacity so when we have those plastic hinge formations on the left and right it will result in a plastic moment that is getting locked at the beam ends and same thing happens when it is going from right to left so that is called a sway action of the beam right and it will cause uh, something like a induced shear so your plastic moments are locked beam supports the vertical load so it will induce a additional shear due to this plastic moment and beam needs to be designed for that so shear design and the detailing of the beam these are the two critical aspects as far as ductility is concerned now in acdc it is quite simple design settings you have to simply tell that ductility is to be used typically we'll recommend a max dia style for top and bottom reinforcement both in case of ductile beams because that gives you a proper well arranged bar arranged uh, for the beam uh, you need to set percentage minimum and maximum but in case of ductile beams if the design criteria overrides the detailing setting that you have given we'll automatically override then of course the material settings so uh, the shear reinforcement typically is governed to be less than certain grade and it is internally done so you know, the reinforcement grade that you set here is used only for the longitudinal reinforcement or the side face reinforcement now if you look at design outputs so first output will be top uh, top reinforcement because that is the first thing that will be determined in ductile beam and in that also the entire length of the beam will have a certain minimum amount of reinforcement and uh, 25% of maximum anywhere is provided throughout the beam as a minimum so that is covering the top reinforcement within its own then next comes the bottom reinforcement now it is the design for the bottom reinforcement is linked to the flexural requirement but also as a percentage of top reinforcement often 50% of top reinforcement and third thing and same thing on the left hand side of the beam and the last is stirrups so you design the shear shear as per the sway shear conditions as we saw earlier and in doing so basically you say top left and a bottom right together or a top right and a bottom left together will give you shear reinforcement uh, in that specific location so that's how the ductile design is handled in uh, acdc coming to flexural report what you can see is that the reinforcement that you calculate at top you know uh, that is calculated and the max of that is considered for the entire beam as a percentage then the, uh, 50% of that is required in the bottom so accordingly you detail the bottom reinforcement uh, even though the required seal is way way less because the bending moment is very small at the injection and that's how you finalize what is the bottom reinforcement at a given location coming to shear report so shear design is calculated in three zones uh, of course you first calculate the shear for normal vertical shear and torsion if at all it is there Uh, once you do that then you do the hugging and sagging moment calculation for the beam as we saw earlier uh, swing to left swing to right calculate the sway shear comparing this with the main shear you arrive at the final design shear and and for that final design shear you uh, calculate the shear reinforcement required and provide for that so that's in total the ductility for the beams let's quickly look at uh, settings which are we talked about let's quickly look at settings for the beams which we talked about so the beams are already red uh, pile is red 
if we go to general and enforcement setting, this is the setting for torsion. As I told you, you can give a value below which it will be ignored, or you can say completely ignore torsion, or you can give a very nominal value, so all torsion will be practically considered. You have to say ductile design. At all station is something that we prefer you to do. And you have to go uh, set maximum and maximum dia at both top and bottom reinforcement. If you want, you can go to bending and uh, biaxial bending and axial force design. And if you click more, as I told you, you can pick various details over here. And other details which are similar, grid of concrete, grid of reinforcement, cover, the diameters, and the specific setting for torsion, which is different rebar for outer and inner stirrups, and the spacing round off for stirrups. And as far as SFR is concerned, you can come here and set maximum diameter, say, high as 32 or something like that, if you expect a very high design. So once these settings are set, you are set to go for design. Uh, Please remember that uh, axial force and biaxial bending is a special case and it is not for every building you should do it. It is not required. Uh, ductile design is, of course, based on the zone in which your project is and what kind of response reduction factor you have, all of that. And ignore torsion is something, again, a judicious call based on what you decide is the good for your building. With that, you can go for the beam design from here on. Now let's look at uh, design of slab. Uh, we are going to talk about three special topics uh, which are covered in general discussions. So let's go ahead. Let's look at the panel method of design and what is the basic workflow. So when we read the geometry from, let's say, a STAD file wherein you have modeled only beams and columns, we read that geometry and we work out uh, through an algorithm empty pockets that form the slab between the beams. And once we read that, we identify and number them starting from S1 onwards to all these slabs. So you have seven slabs here numbered from S1 to S7. There is a particular order in which they are numbered. I think it is based on the CG of the slab uh, in terms of X and Z coordinates of the slab. Uh, once the slabs are numbered, uh, what we do is calculate the spans of the slab. So shorter span LX and longer span LY for each and every slab we calculate. Uh, based on that, then second part is to calculate the uh, continuity of each slab panel. So starting from first to last panel, we work out the continuity effect. So for example, here S3 has uh, two edges continuous, one long and one short. Or S7 in this case has three edges continuous. Uh, the bottom edge is continuous, everything else is continuous. Whereas for S4, all four edges are continuous. So we work out the continuity, uh, which will ultimately help us find out the coefficients. Once we are through that, then we proceed with the design. So we look at the design data. So slab are red, continuity, everything is ready. We of course get the data of dead load and live load from the user. And we get something called as targeted slab thickness. User can very well choose to provide slab thickness to us or we will help him optimize the slab thickness. So there is something called as targeted slab thickness, uh, which we'll look at more in detail when we reach, uh, go to the workflow, uh, design workflow and the deflection control part. Then of course we need the data for grade of concrete, grade of reinforcement, the cover to the reinforcement, all of that. Based on all these factors, then we calculate the bending moment and shear coefficients for each of the every slab panel. Uh, so for each slab panel, there might be potentially four values. Uh, continuity moments along short span, continuity moments along long span, and mid-span moments along short span, mid-span moments along long span. And also the shear coefficients on the both edges. So for example, S4 is a continuous slab on our four sides. So we work out the coefficient based on that. So, and whatever data is available, dead load, live load, all of that. Going to slab design, uh, let's say our target is S4. So we 
basically calculate the bending moment along LX LY as we mentioned along four, there might be four values in this case. So negative bending moment along support at short span, long span and positive bending moment at mid span. Right, so we work out all the movements, then we work out the reinforcement, then we proceed with the shear design. So at the free end, there may be a different shear value, at the fixed end, there may be a shifted shear value. Again, in both directions, there will be shear different. We continuously work on that. The coefficients that are based on the code, so IS code allows the coefficient, the uh, EN code allows coefficients. ACI code is a totally different method, but in a way it works out to something like coefficients only. And then the main algorithm of the slab design coming to thickness optimization. So we start with uh, the type of slab, one way or two way, and the ratio of LX and T. Now that we'll see in design settings specifically. Uh, it could be a number based on the proportion. So for a two-way continuous slab, it may be a number. One-way simply supported slab, it may be a number. That's a target ratio for long short span upon thickness. Based on that, we uh, calculate uh, the minimum thickness based on the user settings and the code provided values. We calculate the self weight of slab, we calculate total load, we calculate bending movements and design the reinforcement. So after getting the slab thickness for individual slab, we calculate the self weight and calculate the bending moment and get the reinforcement. Using that reinforcement, we perform the shear design. Uh, shear design may pass, it may fail. If it fails, uh, we basically increase the rebar till shear check passes. So it comes to the next step. So it, internally, it will keep on giving the rebar till shear check passes. And once it is through, it will go to deflection check. Again, in deflection check, it will use the uh, tensile reinforcement that has been calculated, calculate the modification factor based on that, and perform the deflection check based on the coefficients. We iterate this process. So shear and deflection check are iterative processes. So internally, we keep on increasing. So if deflection check fails, for example, then it will go to increasing the thickness. Thickness increases, so weight increases, so it will go back to calculation of bending movements, then calculate the reinforcement again, then perform the shear design again, and it will go on keep going into the loop till both shear and deflection pass for the reinforcement calculated. If I reach the target thickness in that process, so let's say uh, my target thickness for a particular slab panel is 175 millimeters, and if during the iterative process, I reach 175 millimeters, but I'm not able to pass the deflection check, then I can't increase the slab thickness anymore because that is the limit given by the user. So in this case, I keep on increasing the reinforcement till the deflection passes. So that's iterative process, and that is how the deflection check loop performs. Or if it passes, then of course you get the optimized design for the slab. So that design is final. So this in short covers the uh, philosophy or the logic for slab design. Coming to settings for slab design. So of course the preferred span by D ratio or LX by T ratio as we may call it. So here user can provide the software, the target ratios for each span, type of span. So cantilever, simply supported, continuous, two-way slabs, all of this he can specify ratios. And LX upon this value will become my target thickness. So you can imagine for each slab panel based on these ratios, you will have a target thickness. Of course, you need material cover for both reinforcement, concrete and everything. Then you need a user minimum thickness. So this is specific thickness provided by user as a minimum based on each choice. If he has provided 100, and if my code tells me I can't use anything less than 125, then I have to go for 125 millimeters. And then there are a lot of detailing options. So one of the options is whether the preference is a diameter or a spacing, and depending on the preference, the final detailing will be adopted. And other preference, like available diameters, minimum, maximum spacing, spacing round off, and all of that. Coming to special designs in slab, so first of all, it has to be a one-way slab because special design can be done only for a one-way slab. 
So if it is not a one-way slab, you will have to then go into the special redesign category and perform this one-way design, one-way slab operation. Then he has to specify end conditions. So in this case, it could be pinned at left and fixed at right. Then you can apply various special loads like a point load. Point load, when you apply, you have to give the contact area, which will be used to calculate the effective width resisting the bending moment of that point load or a partial UDL or a triangular load. So these uh, three types of special loads can be applied individually or together on a one-way slab panel. Let us look at how to use this particular method. So when we go to redesign slab, a specific slab, you have to choose the multiple impose loading. Then you have to choose the end condition. So you have four end conditions as I mentioned and a pure cantilever option is also available. You have to also tell user software whether to design as per LX or LOI. So you could choose to design along long span, like for example, typically staircases. You have a staircase which is three meters by six meter area in plan, but the design is along long span, six meters and not along three meters. Then of course you can specify special loads. So a point load, you need a, uh, a location and a value or a contact area. For UDL, you need a start and end location and a value. And for a triangular, again, you need a start and end location and maximum intensity, whether it is at start or at end. So let us look at a typical slab design session in RCDC. So first of all, because we design or uh, we identify all possible slabs, uh, we need to define whether anything is a cutout. Like for example, here it's a lift core. So it's a cutout. Or if it's a toilet area, for example, then it might be, you know, sunk by say my uh, 300 millimeters or something like that. So we need to define these uh, things. Once these two are defined, then we need to provide imposed loading and live load in all these slabs. So let's say I provide imposed load and a live load in the slabs. And in a toilet area, I provide additional imposed load. Okay, let's see. So once this is done, then you go to design settings as we mentioned. So you here you define the preferred span by D ratios. So this is small D. So assuming cover to be 20, 25 millimeters, whatever is the case. So let's stick to this as of now. You define grade of concrete, grade of reinforcement, the cover, minimum cover, or a minimum slab thickness, all of that. And let's say you are ready with the design. And let's say preferred diameter is 12 millimeters. So you immediately design the slabs. It will go through the entire design process. Now it is saying that initial continuity detection is invalid because I added a cutout and a toilet slab which was sunk. So it has re-evaluated the continuity and calculated a design, completed the design, and you can see this output. So it will design the reinforcement for short span, long span for all the slabs. If you look at typical design calculation report, so let's say, take for example a slab S8. So you can see that it will give you span, LY, LX, both the loading that is imposed, slab thickness finally worked out, effective depth in both directions separately, what is the sulfate, total load, then depending on the end conditions, you get short span positive, short span negative, long span positive, long span negative, what is the minimum reinforcement, percentage reinforcement, shear check along both the spans, and finally a deflection check, where the basic span to depth ratio defined is 26, I have the correction factors for compression steel, tensile steel, and all of that. And once I get that, I actually get the permissible deflection ratio and actual deflection ratio. So this is how I use the iterative process uh, for slab design. Uh, if you want to look at a one-way slab design, for example, so let me look at this slab. So it is currently based on the normal design. If I go to multiple impulse loading, I can define both end fix, left and right end fix, and all of that. So we can add 
point loads here. So you need a intensity and a contact width and a location. I can add a load, uh, convert it to into a partial UDL. I can give intensity over here, say four. I can change the end location and start location. And once I'm through, I can design this lab. Now this will, based on the end conditions, which is partially fixed or one end fixed, it will calculate positive bending moments, bending, bending moments, all of that, and complete the design. If I'm okay with that, I can accept the design or I can continue further. So with that, uh, the main presentation part is over. Here I would like to take a moment to talk about uh, mission statement by Bentley. Uh, as you can see, uh, we as a company uh, believe in uh, creating innovative solutions uh, which ultimately empower engineers. And that we believe should help uh, us as uh, you know, engineering fraternity build sustainable uh, structures uh, that are not only uh, safe uh, for its own use, but also uh, in environmentally, uh, so you know, green in that sense. And that is the core thought in all the Bentley engineering uh, solutions, wherein the sustainable infrastructure is our focus. Uh, there are a lot of uh, YouTube videos available. Uh, you can have a look at these links. Uh, there are specific videos available for specific topics. Uh, Bentley Institute has a lot of videos. Uh, there are links available for that. If you reach out to me or any of other colleagues, they will be happy to share whatever contents we have, whatever information we have. In both STAD and RCDC, we have uh, detailed help available, uh, which will take you through the process step by step, and it will also discuss the engineering aspects of the solution. Uh, with that, I thank you all. Uh, thank you for attending the presentation. Hope you find it uh, useful for you in your life as engineers. And uh, I hand over the reins to Sanjeev. Hi, everyone. I think you have uh, been able to learn and, you know, uh, understand the philosophy of uh, design. Um, and that was uh, beautifully explained by Biswas. And uh, we'd like to take some of your time uh, to give us some of, uh, you know, the answers of some questions. So there will be some poll questions which we would like you uh, to uh, provide your views on that one. And it will help us to come up with much more exciting SIG series uh, like this. So we are continuing that one. So the first question um, that uh, we have is following the presentation of today, would you like to be contacted by our sales representative from Bentley system? Please cast your vote. So if you require anything, you know, anything regarding the pricing or anything uh, which will be helpful for you, we are here to help you out. Just cast your vote. Thanks. Uh, we have received your vote. So we are moving to the next one. So we have something called structural enterprise workshop, which comprises of, you know, a package where you will be getting all the uh, structural engineering software. So have you heard about that particular package? Please cast your vote. Thanks, we received that. Uh, so we are moving to the next one. Uh, so, actually, uh, we do plan our SIG series to cater the requirements uh, of the structural engineers and we try to invite you people by some categories. So, we would like to know how many of you are working in building industry. So, please cast your poll over here. Thank you. We have received... So the next uh, question that we'd like to ask you is which product you are using for superstructure concrete design? We have 
stat pro batch mode where you can provide some commands and we will uh, provide you the details in stat output file so if you're using that one even uh, all of you are aware that uh, stat pro has an interoperability with uh, rcdc from stat pro interface you can take the model for design of your beam slabs columns and shear walls so if you're using that one we have got another uh, structural package known as ram structural system whether you are using that one and the others are mentioned so please cast your vote and it will help us uh, to design our next session to cater your requirement thank you we have received your votes <sighs> So uh, actually, we are uh, continuing uh, this SIG series uh, starting from the first quarter of this year. So we would like to know how many of the SIG series of the SIG sessions, other rather I would say, you have attended so far. Even uh, those who have uh, not attended uh, the past sessions will be sending you and a personal email where uh, we, will, we will be just sharing you the link from where you can view those sessions again. Thank you. We are moving to the next one. Which software you are using for foundation design? We have Stat Pro Advanced in rcdc we can uh, go for uh, your foundation design whether you are using that one if you are using the ram concept and the other software even uh, you may be using the excel sheets or the manual calculation or any other software just may I cast your vote over here thanks for your time um uh, the last one we are moving to the last one so the last uh, uh, poll question is which software are you using for concrete slab design? 